in this week's In Ear Insights. Let's talk about a situation that happened at Trust Insights last week that I want your perspective on, Katie, because you were instrumental in it. Um, it was uh, to for, for background, we have an account manager. Uh, her name is Kelsey, who is an absolutely outstanding, wonderful person to work with. And I wrote a prompt that did mm -hmm. detailed analysis of some SEO data. Uh, you know, it's mm -hmm. like, you know, this long and stuff like that. You following the, the Trust Insights race framework and the pair framework and all that stuff. And it does a decent job of producing good insights. The prompt does. And one of the things that you had said in response to it was, perhaps we should not have the machine doing all of the work. Perhaps the human who is assembling the report should have some background knowledge so that they know what they're looking at. Yep. And so my question, I have a couple of questions for you, Katie. Mm -hmm. One, why do you think, and I, I know the answer, so I want to hear it from you. Why do you think it's important <laughs> to have that background information as the person operating the machinery? And two, yep. as AI becomes more and more capable and, uh, <clears throat> goes from today assisting someone to, with doing, in this task, particular task, interpreting backlink information, uh, to just being out, able to outright do it soup to nuts. At what point, if any, does the human need to be involved anymore with something that's a relatively routine reporting task? Um, so I think, I mean, it's a great topic, and I think this is a really good example. You know, so for full context, um, as Chris mentioned, we brought on Kelsey as our account manager and Kelsey comes from a different background. I brought her on for her organizational and managerial skills, knowing that uh, things like marketing and, um, you know, SEO and all that stuff can be taught. She's very similar to my, you know, experience when I started working with Chris. I was brought on for my experience as a manager, not as my experience in marketing. I had very little in digital marketing. And so people very first day were saying things like, you know, CPC and ROI. And I was like, I don't know what any of that means, but I know that I can manage this team. And so for me, it was a bit of a learning curve. And that's where Kelsey is finding herself. Now, the difference is when I started, everything was still very hands on. And Kelsey is now, you know, learning in the age of AI can do it for you. So you know, Chris, you had said, you know, we're going to give you some training. We're going to give you some, you know, uh, reports to put together and, you know, AI can generate the insights for it. The reason I paused and said, yes, AI can generate the insights for it, but let's have Kelsey learn the stuff first, because I knew from experience, from my own experience, if you just let the machine do it, you yourself, the human, are never going to actually learn the words on the page. And I know that at this point in you know her career, Kelsey is not as familiar with the content that's on the page. And I want her to learn that. The reason, I want her to learn that for a couple of reasons. And I think this is true of anyone who's just going straight to let the AI do it, is you then don't know if the AI is giving you back good insights, bad insights, wildly incorrect insights, you know, something, especially if you're giving this to a manager, a board, a client, if you then can't stand behind the report and explain what's on the page, because they look at it and say, well, this is wrong. And you're like, well, the AI did it. That's a really terrible excuse because you as the human are still responsible. Nobody's going to hold the AI responsible because you, the human, are still the one who can get in trouble. You're the one who can get fired. AI doesn't care. AI has job security. It's fine. So when the situation came up last week, I wanted to pause and make sure that the human understood the terms and the context and the data on the page so that when she got more comfortable using AI to do the analysis, she could more easily say, yes, this is right. No, this is not right. The problem that a lot of professionals are going to run into, especially ones who are just starting to come up in the industry, is that AI can do it for you. And so I say it's a problem because that means that you're never going to learn the skills. You're never going to learn how to do it yourself. And there are times when AI is going to fail. AI is not going to be available. And you'll be so dependent on the machines doing it for you that you then can't do it yourself. I think about, you know, basic 
you know, skills. I mean, I hear this from a lot of my friends who have uh, teenage kids, you know, things like writing a check. It's not something that, you know, kids growing up learn anymore. And yet there's still a need for it. Maybe not all the time, but there's still enough of a need for it that when it comes up and they don't know how to do it or balance a checkbook or balance your account rather, like they're sort of like, well, uh, the machine's always done it for me. What do you mean I have to manually take out a piece of paper and a pen? It's the same with like learning how to write cursive. Is there a need for it? And sometimes, yeah, there are. But it's not being taught anymore because the machines do it. Everything is computerized and typing. So that's my very long-winded response <laughs> uh, to maybe one or two of your questions to say, I think that it's appropriate to be using AI to do the analysis if you know what the analysis is supposed to be, if you already know what all the pieces are. My counter argument on... Um, the, the point you said about uh, blaming the AI is that that's kind of the situation as it's been in marketing analytics for a decade. We all know beyond a shadow of a doubt that what is in, for example, Google Analytics is an approximation of reality. It is not reality. Anytime, anyone who's ever had to reconcile, hey, the number of form fills in you know, recorded in GA does not match up with what's in HubSpot or what's in Salesforce and stuff is 100% of people, right? There's, there is, there's no contest that this stuff is badly flawed. Mm -hmm. In those instances, um, I mean, you can blame Google, but Google's like, yeah, whatever. We don't care. This isn't for you. This has helped make our ad business better. Um, and so people hire companies like Trust Insights <laughs> that say, can you get us closer to this? So in the case where... AI is doing the work and perhaps it is not as correct as it could be. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, me as the software developer to, who makes the prompts and things has the obligation to improve the software. But does the human, as a software, it gets more and more and more advanced. Do we need the human after, after a certain point? I think it really depends. Um, it depends on... Well, I would say yes, there has to be still some kind of human intervention so that it's not completely unsupervised and going off the rails. Um, you know, I think about, you know, one of our clients, if we handed them a report that had incorrect information in it, and we said, well, and they and they called us out and we said, well, AI did it, they'd be like, well, why are you letting AI, you know, give you incorrect information? That's what I mean by AI is not taking the blame. Mm -hmm. Clients and other people are still looking for humans to blame. People, it's human nature to want to find somebody to blame, somebody accountable. Somebody has to be responsible for this. Emphasis on the somebody, not the something. And they want to be mad at someone. You know, even if it's not a human's fault, it doesn't matter. And so that's sort of my, that's where I'm coming from when I say I want my team, I can't control anyone else, but I would like my team to understand the pieces before letting AI take it. Because I know from experience that if we put out something that is slightly off or incorrect and our reasoning is that, well, we didn't do it, AI did, people are still going to be mad at us. They'll be like, well, why didn't you supervise your AI to do better? Mm hmm no, I think that that's perfectly valid. Um, the way that I see these tools evolving, I think a lot of companies will be at a point where they're like, yeah, we're just going to outsource this entire task to a machine. And so there the, there will be a maybe an account manager who just hands off the report, mm -hmm. but then says, yep, this was made by machines from your data. And, and that's that. Um, because we see that already to some degree. We see that with SaaS companies. SaaS companies will create software that a client logs into. And you know, you log into a Google Analytics or a Domo or whatever. And like, yeah, the report's the report. There you go. Good luck. Which is a huge risk. It's a huge risk. And so, yes, companies are doing that. But I think that you're sort of in some ways comparing apples and oranges. And so... You know, if you take Google Analytics, for example, so, you know, Google has put together this piece of software that tracks your website data. 
And they say, here's a portal from all of our clients to log into. And then what they get is what they get. That's not exactly true. Like, yes, what you see is what you get. But then there's still theoretically a person for you to go back to and say, there is a problem with my account or the way that you built it is incorrect and we need to fix it. You know, and so there's a lot of moving pieces. You know, I can see that you're ready to argue with me about this. Um, my point isn't that, you know, companies like Google have said, hey, you're on your own kid because they have. I'm not denying that. <laughs> my point is that we as humans are still looking for the human to blame for the technology problem, even if the problem is the tech. So that's my point. It's not that, you know, we're not just letting tech run autonomously without us. We are. We absolutely are. I think it's a huge risk because look how bad Google's reputation has gotten. Look how many people have abandoned Google Analytics because of a mediocre, not working product, because there's no one who's fixing it. There's no one who's, so people are finding other solutions. You know, Google's falling behind in a lot of places because they've let the machines just sort of do the thing. That's the risk I'm talking about. So that's Google. Google is way bigger than Trust, Trust Insights will ever be. We make a couple of wrong steps as a very small company and Trust Insights is done. Especially if we say, hey, you know, the machines did it. We had nothing to do with it. It's still our name. It's still our reputation. So you can argue with me all you want about this, Chris. But the machines are not ever in in this context and trust insights ever just going to run without human intervention. And in your example of bringing on an account manager just to deliver the reports, that's still a risk because if the account manager or a human is not doing quality assurance on the reports, making sure the information is correct. If the humans does not know what is contained within the report, that's a risk. And that will not happen under my watch. Shouldn't you be using the machines to also do QA? It's sort of the same idea of having a developer QA their own work. The answer is no. <laughs> no, absolutely not. Hard no, period. It's interesting because that's actually how I use them to check myself. I will say, okay, I've written this report, go through it and make sure I didn't say anything stupid. But see, you just said you wrote it, mm -hmm. the machine's checking it, not the machine wrote it, the machine checked it. So there's right, like, there's I would have still... the machine check itself as well when we get to that point. But here's the thing you at, you're not just saying, okay, the machine wrote it. Great. Let's just send it. You, the human are still reading it to make sure that what the machine wrote is not incorrect. If you're saying machine, check my work, you, the human, are still checking the machine, checking your work, saying, did the machine check my work correctly? So you're proving my point over and yes. over again that the human can't step out of the process completely. The human still has to be the subject matter expert. Yes. So with that, then... For all the companies that are looking at this vendor, that vendor, the, all these different tools, mm -hmm. thinking about how many people can we lay off and save money and boost our profit margins, um, what is the proper role for AI, particularly within analytics? I think it, you know, it's if you want to look at your team holistically, AI is a team member. AI is not the whole team. AI is one part of the team. And I think that that's fine. I think, you know, I'm not anti AI. I think there's a lot of things that AI can do. I think that you can use it to help analyze your reports. I think you can do it to QA. I think you can do it to write all of your software. I think those things are totally appropriate. You need to have a subject matter expert paired with the AI. That's how that needs to work. So if the AI is the worker, you need the subject matter expert paired right next to it, checking its work, almost micromanaging it to say, did you do the thing correctly? Because AI doesn't care if it's micromanaged, you know, no feelings, no emotions, whatever. You need someone who understands what the output is supposed to be working directly next to AI. Mm -hmm. Especially for iteration. So let's look at an example of this so that we can put... Uh, put it into practice um, to what Katie was saying. 
This is an example of one of the reports. Now, this is not generated by AI. This is generated by good old-fashioned statistics uh, written in the R programming language. This talks to the Google Analytics API. Um, actually, no, this talks to the Ahrefs API and says, what domains linked to your website in the last, uh, I think this is 60 days? Yeah, 60 days. So this is from my personal website. We can see there's a bunch of different domains here and the number of links. It's a very straightforward chart. Let's take a look at what generative AI said, given the same level of prompt um, that we were that we were talking about earlier in the show. It says, "Here's the." Uh, I gave it the chart. I said, "Tell me, explain what's in this chart." I did the the pre priming step, saying, "What do you know about analyzing inbound links first, so that we we populate the history and we load the chart and ask it for reference recommendations." And the instructions given um, to Kelsey on our team was to say, "Look through what it pointed out and pick out you know one or two things to highlight." on this chart. So it says, good, you've got a diverse backlink profile, a presence of high authority links, consistent link building. The first scene seems to indicate uh, ongoing link building efforts. Areas for improvement, over-reliance on a few domains, lack of information on link quality, limited insight into anchor text diversity, recommendations, diversify backlink sources, focus on quality over quantity, conduct a backlink audit. Now, here's the chart again. Based on those recommendations and and your knowledge of link building katie how do you think ai did i think it did okay i think it did okay there was a couple of things that uh a couple of terms i got tripped up on and i knew that you know as kelsey's learning um you know the fundamentals of seo i knew if i said well what does it mean when you say this she'd be like i'm not really sure that to me is a red flag to say, well, then you can't put it in the report if you don't understand what it means. So I think one of them was like lack of diverse anchor text, you know, and so and I'm looking at this, re I'm looking at this particular output and I'm like, where did you get that information for this? Like this information, this particular chart doesn't contain that information. So how did you get from A to B? And when a client says, well, what does that mean? You have nothing to point back to. So that was my concern over letting AI just go ahead and do an analysis and having someone who's less familiar with the pieces accept the output and say, and this is it. So when I was reading through, um, you know, the initial analysis, again, all training, you know, she hadn't done anything incorrectly. She was learning. I said, well, what does this mean? What does this mean? You know, you keep going back to diverse links. What does it mean to have more diverse links? What does that look like? How would you explain it to me as the person who needs to take action? And all of that context was missing from, you know, the AI analysis. And some of the analysis, quite frankly, I don't know where it came from. Mm -hmm. So I'm now going to prove your point entirely. Yes. And completely. The day so this is, is my mine. website. <laughs> <laughs> this is my website. Okay. And I and the AI's um, outputs actually gave me some really good ideas for improving this report because there are gaps to just this particular slide. There are gaps that could make this report more informative, like putting the actual domain authority on mm -hmm. here so that we know the quality of these, these domains. What this report tells me as the website owner and as someone who has been doing SEO since 1994, aka 30 years, is that my site is followed by a bunch of crypto bots. <laughs> and they are scraping my content. And because my content can, is loaded up with links to my site and trust insights and stuff, those get repeated in the scraped content. That's why you see auxiliary FX which, and Forex trading binary FX. These are all sites that scrape other people's content in an attempt to boost their own reputation so that they can then hawk their you know, crypto products, whatever. Those are crap links. And those mm -hmm. are crap sites. Um, those are not sites that you know, you you would generally want linking to you unless you were also a crypto company of some kind. And so what this tells me is that even though those sites are generating a lot of links, um, they're probably not very good quality. And you know, having domain authority on here would certainly help, perhaps even having a threshold in the code itself to say, let's not show anything with the domain authority under 50, for example, um, to, to weed out some of these. But the prompt was insufficient. Even though we primed it with good data 
it wasn't specific to the way that we do things. And this is the essential part of generative AI and the, the essential part of your AI strategy. Your prompts, if you want them to do well, have to contain a lot of your unique perspective and your human-led perspective on how the machine should think. So first thing I would do to improve this is add domain authority, maybe add it, even add a filter, or at least in the prompt say, ignore any domain with a authority under 50. And then second, based on that, get rid of any recommendations that are clearly just scrapers and then do your assessment about link, inbound link quality because the machine did exactly as it was told. Mm -hmm. It said provide recommendations based on this data. Even that prompt could be could have some nuance because if we told Kelsey the exact same thing, she'd be like, okay, I'm going to do my best to, to, to come up with something because that's what's expected of me. Mm -hmm. When the real answer might be, there's not much here to do to work with. And, and you would only know that if you knew the business, in this mm -hmm. case, my website, if you knew the, the domain, aka SEO, mm -hmm. and you had some idea of what you were looking at. And that's something that is knowledge that's encoded in our heads as subject matter experts, but it's it, we didn't put it in the prompt. So mm -hmm. I think for this task in the future, what would be a, a useful exercise is as Kelsey trains up on SEO, and as 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 we provide guidance, we also write that down so that it becomes part of the prompt. Yep, the day is mine. <laughs> no, but I think that that's exactly it, and that's the risk of people going straight from no experience to AI can do it for me. Is you know so. One of the things that, you know, I still have to look up is so I understand, you know, domain authority and domain rating. You looking at that list at a glance can tell what links are what. I would still have to go look up links individually and say, is this one a high quality link or not? And so, you know, that's sort of like that's sort of the difference between you and I in terms of our expertise. I understand all of the pieces, but there's still parts that I need to double check before I'm like, okay, the machine got it right. But, you know, again, there was still some recommendations in there, like about the anchor tax that I'm like, where did that come from? You know, and so someone who's less familiar, who doesn't maybe know the thresholds of good domain authority, what that means for your site, you know, it's like, oh, but you're getting a lot of inbound links. That's great. High quality, low quality, like, okay, does it matter? Like, those are things that you really need to understand. And to your point, the what you consider low quality for your site might be high quality for a different site. And that's where it gets, you know, very murky. So you have to have that subject matter expertise. And so that, I think that is the whole point of this episode is that, yeah, AI can do it. AI can totally do it, but you still have to know what the AI is doing in order for the outputs to be trusted. AI is very much like the, the fairy tale genie in a lamp, right? It will do as it's told. It will give you what you asked for, which means if you are not super clear about what you ask for, you will get it. And it may not be, uh, it may be what you want. It may not be what you need and certainly may not be what your customers need uh, or your, or your team needs. And this is a really good example of even something as simple as, Hey, try this out in generative AI clearly needs a lot more customization if we want it to do it the trust insights way. So like mm -hmm. we can have it do it the generic way, but you know, here's the generic knowledge about SEO mm -hmm. or we can say to do it the trust insights way. These are all the things that you need to know. You need to have the domain rating on the chart. You need to have some color coding so that it's visible to the machine. You need to have an, uh, an explanation, a step by step explanation of how you drew the conclusion so that we can check your thinking and check mm -hmm. your work. You need to have, you know, this, that, and the other thing. And having all that in the, the prompt, you know, and the prompt will be like, you know, this long, that's okay because. It's now no longer the generic result that everyone else is going to get using 
generative AI. It's going to be keyed in and tuned in to the way that we do stuff. And I think that is probably the, the big takeaway is making sure that you invest the time to properly develop your software as opposed to just going for fast and easy. Well, I think that's a big takeaway, but also the big takeaway is that your people actually need to know the subject, the subject. And so, you know, in order to write that prompt, the team needs to be subject matter experts in the thing. So I, that's the two takeaways. I don't want to lose mm -hmm. the human side in favor of just write better prompts for AI. You still need people who know the thing so that, you know, it's why Kelsey is training and you and I are the trainers. We can very quickly look at the report and go, yes, that's correct. No, that's not correct. Because we've been doing this a long time. We have the experience that we can very quickly go, yes, no, yes, no. Here's how to fix that. She will get there if we let her get there. If we just give her AI, she won't get there. Mm -hmm. And so, no surprise. The 5P <laughs> framework. Well, and that's um, it. I, it's, you know, when using AI, when training teams, when building reports, whatever it is you're doing, starting with the 5P framework is a really good decision because it's just going to outline all of the pieces. So what is your purpose? Who are your people? What is the process? What are the platforms? And how are you going to measure success with your performance? And so starting with your purpose, I want to train my am on how to use ai correctly so that she can use it to generate a larger volume of reports caveat being train correctly and then you go through the other piece and even with this report you know it was, it was something of a failing on both of our parts neither one of us explained what the purpose of this report is what do you do with it like when you hand it to the client what is the client supposed to do with this thing um, mm -hmm. because it, it isn't clear even nope. if you if you don't know what inbound links are supposed to do you know the purpose of inbound links is to improve the reputation of your website and and dr drive direct you know, referral traffic to your site that needs to be written out explicitly in in the 5p assessment and then in the report itself like here's what you're supposed to be doing if you're not doing mm -hmm. it then it's going to show up in the report as like hey all these random crypto links they are not serving the purpose of inbound links. And this report is supposed to reflect that. Well, and that's sort of the other thing that I really love about the five P's is it helps keep you focused on what it is you're doing. So if it doesn't, if the recommendations or the actions don't line up back to the purpose, then it's just going to be a distraction. And it's just sort of like erroneous data that can go somewhere else. Um, you know, so if the purpose of the report is to improve inbound links, then why are you telling me about, you know, this great ad that you put together over here? Like that's, yeah, it might be a good idea, but it has nothing to do with what we're talking about at present. Yep. So to wrap up, for any task where you were thinking about using AI, make sure you go through the full five Ps. What is the purpose? Who are the people are involved and what knowledge do they have and don't they have? And what knowledge will they need to be able to accomplish the purpose? What processes do you have in place and how well documented are they or not? Um, then you get to the, the AI doing the portions that are appropriate for it to do and ultimately measuring the performance, whether you saved time, saved money or made money with the, with it, because ultimately it, everything has to somehow find its way to that. Um, if you don't do those things, then yeah, AI is probably going to underperform and you're not going to get the benefits that you're hoping for. Yeah. Train your people, if, then train your AI. Or do, or I would say do both train your people and document everything so that training your AI is easier because if you, if you take the time to do the documentation. <laughs> yes. Yes. Then feeding it to an AI is super easy and you don't have to do the same work twice. Uh, for those who don't know why I'm so excited, this is like a big, this is a big deal to get a developer to be pro documentation. And it is just, it's, it's a win for the non-technical people. <laughs> Such a big win. 
if you have stories about how you have trained people and or machines or how you leverage subject matter experts with AI and you want to share those stories, pop on over to our free Slack group. Go to trustinsights.ai slash analytics for marketers where you and over 3,000 other marketers are asking and answering each other's questions every single day about analytics, AI, and all other things marketing. And wherever it is you watch or listen to the show, if there's a channel you'd rather have it on instead, go to trustinsights.ai slash TI podcast. You can find us on most places where podcasts are served. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll talk to you next time.